Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Reto Meyer. I'm the tech lead on the Android Developer Relations team. And as part of the uh, Android Developer Relations team, a lot of our job is to uh, listen to you guys, ask questions from these guys, and tell you guys the answers. So I thought it may be a little bit more fun to let you guys ask them directly, still through me, so that we can keep everything nice and smooth. So uh, I thought we'd start off by, uh, by having our team introduce each other, so, or at least introduce themselves, perhaps. Each other could be fun, but no, we'll stick with, it, uh, stick with themselves, starting uh, perhaps with Matthias at the end. Okay, hi, my name's Matthias Duarte, um, and I lead the Android design team. Hi, I'm Rachel Garb, I'm an interaction designer on Matthias' team. I'm Jeff Hamilton, I'm the tech lead for Google Play Services. I'm Adam Powell, I'm on the Android framework team. I'm Rebecca Zavin, I'm on the Android systems team. Uh, I'm Dan Morrill, I was recently promoted to VP of lunch, apparently. And uh, I'd just like to say hollow yellow. <laughs> uh, Dave Burke, Eng's director for the Android platforms. I'm Ficus Kirkpatrick. I lead the Play Store team. I'm Roman I work on the Android framework team. I'm Xavier Ducroy. I'm the tech lead for the SDK and developer tools. I'm Diane Hackborn. I work on the Android framework team. All right, thanks everyone. So uh, the purpose of the fireside chat is really for you guys to be able to interact with some of the people which actually build the stuff uh, that we often talk about. So it is really about interaction. So we've got a couple of microphones set up. If you guys want to uh, start lining up uh, to ask you questions, I'm gonna start off with a few things which we tend to get asked a lot in developer relations. So I thought rather than making up my own answers, I would give these guys the opportunity to respond for a change. So uh, one thing which, uh, which I get asked a lot is, you know, Android is a really big project. It certainly hasn't gotten any smaller over the years. So a lot of independent developers wonder, how do you continue to maintain that same sort of velocity without sacrificing quality? <laughs> um, I just depend on really smart people over here to uh, <laughs> do good work. Um, I don't know, that's, that's a really good question. Um, we, you know, we, we do uh, planning around releases. So, you know, we, we think about what we want to do in the release. We sort of survey across the whole team. Uh, we try to come up with themes for what we're trying to work on, like in Jelly Bean, and we try to work on Jank, et cetera. Um, and really, it's just about rallying the team around that. And, and, and you know, a lot of the engineers and, and UX folks and product managers on Android are just very passionate about what they do, and they, they want to build the best possible product and, and full of energy and really smart. And uh, yeah, it's as simple as that. I mean, the other thing I would say is, is, is the uh, industry is very competitive and it's you know, changing all the time. And some, something we do on Android is we try to be very agile. So we, we constantly sort of evaluate where we're doing, where we are, where we're, where we're weakest, where we're stronger, uh, and, and sort of adjust our plans to that. Um, and I think that helps with our, with our velocity as well um, because we're kind of very self-aware of, of where we're going. Uh, I think what he meant was it keeps us chained to our desks, really. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, I've got a follow-up question for that, but first, um, we're going to answer the questions from you guys at the front, but I'd encourage everyone else who lines up to do so at the back mic so that we don't have heads in the video. Um, so the follow-up was, you know, given the velocity, the speed at which uh, the Android team is developing new frameworks, is there, is there anything that you would have done differently, like looking back at, uh, at the, the things which have launched and some of those choices. Anything, if you'd had a little bit more time, you could go back and change. How much time do we have? <laughs> I think we've got about 36 minutes. <laughs> um, I think, and you probably won't like this, but I think probably the biggest thing that's, um, you know, we would have, we should have done differently in a few places was, ha um, there's a few places where we should have had more control over applications. Um, like a, a big example is the, the whole settings provider that we just let applications go and write to it, um, which was just, it was a simple thing that we, we shouldn't have done and it's been like, those kind of things where you let, let applications do things are really hard to get away from, so it takes a long time to kind of clean up that kind of stuff. You know, there's, there's of course lots of things that you look back and you're like, yeah, that could have been done better, but you know, usually it's like, you know, implementation or even APIs are pretty easy to change, but when it's things that you let applications do that you're like, uh, maybe we shouldn't have done that, those are really hard to recover from. <laughs> Any other takers? Ficus, did you want to uh, add anything to that? Uh, well, I was just talking a little trash about content providers to uh, <laughs> Jeff. 
Um, <laughs> Yeah, it, it, there's a there's a long list, you know. I mean, I think uh, you're you're never gonna get it right. Uh, you're never gonna get everything right the first time, and uh, I don't really regret any of the mistakes we've made um, because I think getting things out there uh, at the speed we did and um, having the opportunity to get the feedback and iterate was actually the most important thing. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask one question, which uh, was asked by G Plus by uh, Peter Van der Linden on exactly this topic, and. Uh, he suggested that the, uh, the binder software for Android PC, uh, IPC is now in its third implementation after BOS and Palm OS. Um, and he asks, uh, are you any closer to getting it right? <laughs> so that may be a little bit inflammatory. Uh, so let me ask you this. Are you happy with the Android IPC binder implementation? And is there anything that you would do differently if you got a fourth attempt to do it? Um, well, you, I mean, you never ever get anything perfectly right. So, you know. <laughs> Um, so um, we're, we're happy with it, and you know I think the phrasing of that is very misleading because it wasn't that it was changed because like we weren't happy with what we had before, but it, it was rewritten to to address the needs each time, and you know like the uh, for uh, for Android we had a very different environment where it was really just used for IPC instead of the previous version which had was built around C++ and had a lot of dynamic lang language features that don't exist in C++, so we kind of built them up ourselves. And once we moved over to Android, we were doing that in Java, and that all that dynamic part of it just didn't make sense with jo the Java language already having a lot of those features. So we, you know, you, the right thing to do is go and like look at well, what do we need now, and build what makes sense for your what, for what you need then. Perfect. All right. So let's. Uh, you guys have been waiting patiently. The starting at the front, perhaps. What's your question? Hi, I'm uh, Eric Gray from Canada, Vancouver. Um, I, my main question was uh, about uh, Android updates, and I know that there has been an awful lot of uh, talk about fragmentation, uh, the F word for Android, and I know that it has vastly improved in the latest versions, but there's still a gross number of people using 2.2 uh, .2 and 2.3, and as you guys said at one of the uh, previous IOs, you have been working with um, the OEMs to make the update process a lot faster and smoother, but no one really is seeing this change. So is there still a continued effort in this area? Uh, yeah, very good question. Um, this is something we think about a lot, actually. Um, so, you know, there's multiple levels to it. Uh, you know, if you think about what we do, we, we, you know, we release open source and then Silicon vendors take that open source and then they uh, bring it up on their on their particular uh, SOC. And they create what they call a BSP. Then they have the BSP to the OEM, and then the OEM produces a phone. and And so there's this big sort of channel uh, before an actual update gets out. Um, and so we're doing a lot of things, you know, internally thinking about how we can actually streamline that process. Part of it is making the actual code for the platform more layered, so that you know, if a silicon vendor needs to make changes, they have a very clean abstraction layer to do that. Uh, so we're looking to streamline it. The other thing we're we're looking at is is to try to understand uh, you know the the hardware profile of of different uh, devices running different Android versions. So there is a predominance of of gingerbread in uh, emerging markets, for example, and and so one of the reasons for that is because. Uh, uh, it runs on uh, lower memory than some of the, the newer uh, Android versions. And it's not so much the system, but actually the applications themselves tend to be more advanced and, and richer. Um, and so we're looking at ways to you know, make Android more efficient uh, uh, for, the, for the sort of entry level smartphone as well um, to help to improve that situation. Yeah, I want to jump in also on the other end um, to reaffirm how important updates are for Android and how we really are working in lots of different ways, and the relationships with our uh, OEM partners are really important to us. Um, you know, sometimes it can seem like you don't see a lot of that, uh, but it is a very complex problem for them. It matters a lot to us. We're working on it. Uh, one small sign of our efforts there is what we announced yesterday, the Galaxy S4, that has the, uh, uh, the Nexus software experience and will have more timely updates. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, from the back. Um, I'm wondering for NDK developers that want to exploit multi-core parallelism, um, are you doing anything there in terms of new capabilities, or are there existing tools or libraries that you would recommend? We use threads. <laughs> <laughs> 
a good answer. Uh, it's very thorough. To, yeah, okay. To, to be fair, uh, the NDK is pretty simple and we know it's difficult to use. Uh, and that probably won't make you feel better, but it's not that much better for us when we write native code. Uh, I've been writing a l way too much native code this past few years and we don't have anything in particular that you don't have uh, when it comes to multi-threading or using multiple cores. Um, I mean, there are low-level APIs. Uh, I don't know, I think they are exposed in the NDK where you can create a number of cores and then you can make your decisions based on that, but maybe Diane knows more. No. Thank you. Uh, again, from the front. Hi, my name is Daniel. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the navigation drawer. It was mentioned uh, in the session that one of the advantages is that you can access it from anywhere from your application. But uh, shouldn't that actually be only accessible from your uh, root activities or the top level activities? And the reason I'm asking this is that if you allow the user to access uh, the navigation drawer anywhere from your application, uh, from your application from, like categories and details, wouldn't that like just keep adding more and more and more activities to the stack and then make kind of hard for the user to remember what the back button or the up button is going to do since they have now an infinite number of activities on the stack? Uh, I'll take that one just to jump in real quick, which is uh, if you're just adding activities onto the stack without regard for your app structure, you're not doing it right. <laughs> So to go a little bit deeper on that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, th I think we're done there. Um, no, please. <laughs> so if you do use the navigation drawer at deeper levels of your application, then you should treat some of those navigation targets the same way that you would treat either a notification or a widget coming from another part of your application. So go ahead and just replace the full task stack to build something that makes sense for that destination. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, I guess while we've got the designers talking, I um, had a couple of other questions which have, have come up. So there's a lot of people just sort of getting involved in the world of design for the first time, largely because of all the talks that we give at I.O. and how much importance we say that there is around it. So what are some of the tools that you guys use uh, within the Android team to sort of, you know, design the platform user experience? And to follow on from that as well, what, where are some of the places you get your inspiration from? I think a lot of the people here get their inspiration from what we do. Um, so where do you guys get that inspiration from to begin with? I think one of our most important tools is um, our studio where we sit together in an open environment so we're always talking with each other. And I, we have such an eclectic group, I think that everybody gets inspiration from, from different things. Um, I've seen people share you know, architecture, designs of cars, uh, sci-fi movies, um, Matthias' shirts, you know, <laughs> they come from anywhere. <laughs> Uh, so I think just being together and, and sharing a lot and bouncing ideas off of each other not only um, provides inspiration, but is also a big tool for us in terms of how we, we work together. Because um, the more input that we get on our designs, just the better it gets each time we refine. Do you have anything to add? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's see. I think we're up to the back. Yes. So um, Android uh, SDK recommends the use of the JDK 1.6. Uh, that has been a, at this point officially uh, end of life is uh, and and large corporations help desks like to uh, you know push out updates to say oh get rid of this um, is the Android SDK going to be moving to 1.7 or what what's the roadmap there um, so we're we're investigating looking at a couple options. Uh, haven't made any decisions yet, so I don't have anything to announce, but we're aware of that. Okay. Wait, uh, was the question about running the tools on a host, JDK 1.7? Uh, running uh, the, yeah, running the compiler, running the, the, yeah. Uh, the SDK. Yeah, so, so to run the host tools now, you can run uh, them on 1.7 or 7. Uh, there was this, an issue before where signing didn't really work if you have a JDK 7 installed, but we fixed that in 21.2, I think. So okay. you, you can do proper signing now directly if you use uh, 7 on your host computer. Okay, thank you. Great. And uh, from the front. Hi, I'm Ask. Uh, my name is Drew, and I'm asking this question both as an Android user uh, and as uh, a developer. Uh, I wonder um, what you know, thoughts and considerations have gone in the platform for having optional application per permissions. So say my application must have this group of five permissions but for these features, here's, you know, uh, if you want to use this feature, you'll have to grant us access to, uh, to these uh, applications. And, and the perfect example is I've been using an app called, called Pocket, which I really enjoy. Um, 
they added a recent update, which wanted access to my contacts, and it, it set off my inner tinfoil hat a little bit. And I haven't installed that update either. <laughs> um, um, there have certainly been a lot of thoughts put into this. Um, there's nothing that we have, you know, that we can commit to doing right now, but we're definitely thinking about this. Thank you. Uh, so another question, sort of going uh, a little bit deeper perhaps this time. So Android runs on a huge variety of hardware and we do uh, new platforms and new devices quite regularly. Can uh, anyone comment on what was perhaps the most challenging chipset or device to bring up? <laughs> All of them? No, I think what the, the most challenging, well the most challenging was probably the first one. Uh, because we were starting from scratch, and it, you know, if you look today, um, our silicon vendor, as, as Dave was pointing out, you know, sort of our silicon vendors consume the Android framework and come up with a BSP. They all have BSPs now uh, that they provide that run Android. But in, when we started on the G1, there was there was nothing, and there was no not really Linux support on, on Qualcomm's hardware. So that was definitely the most challenging. I think in an ongoing way, um, it's it's more challenging when we're the first. Uh, the first to a new architecture. So if you if you look at something like the Nexus 10, it's it, that was the one of the first devices to ship on the the, the newest ARM design. And obviously, there you know there's sort of the usual challenges with being the early an early adopter. Uh, so so I think that's probably the, the most challenging is when we're the, kind of the first to a new uh, CPU architecture, a new GPU architecture, uh, and you're you're always are kind of experience some of the pain of, of of little bugs and and just new features that you have to figure out how to make use of. So. I mean, we uh, we work um, pretty closely with all with all of, all of the uh, Silicon partners. Um, you know, just to give you an example of, of how that works. So, so with Hardware Composer, which is used for accelerating composition, uh, we'll come up with a new design for that, and then we will work with you know the likes of Qualcomm, Nvidia, etc., uh, ARM, and you know say, hey, look, here's the new interface that we want to implement. What do you think of it? And then they'll give us feedback and say, oh, that's really hard for us to do on one chipset, or another chipset might say, well, it'll work on us, but it's not performant. What if you tweak it this way? Um, and so we do a lot of iteration in that respect, so that we try to build a system so that it works, uh, you know, as well as it, it really well on, on a broad range of uh, hardware. And we don't always get it right, and we have to iterate. And uh, we, we you'll see that in our hardware layers that we're, you know, often uh, in, in, in iterating and improving them. But you know, our goal is to make Android work, you know, well across uh, a variety of different hardware um, and make it uh, easy for OEMs to bring up devices quickly. So following on from that, I mean, you said the first one was the hardest, and obviously there's been a lot of changes. The pace of mobile uh, device improvement has been quite staggering. Do you think we've kind of plateaued now? Is all the hard work behind us? No, no new chips, no new sensors. Are we kind of done or, uh, or not? What do you think? No, it's just like, <laughs> I, I don't know, I feel like Android's a baby. I feel like there's so much more we can do. Um, I think there's new, uh, I mean, if you actually just look at the power, like it's only really this year, the GPUs have got powerful enough that they can actually think about doing something other than draw the screen, right? Like to so actually do computation on the GPU. Um, and so that's kind of opening up a whole lot of doors. We have a, a language called RenderScript that allows you to target C kernels to, to the GPU. Um, we're seeing lots of new peripherals appear, like uh, I think the Samsung Galaxy S4 has an IR transmitter, for example. Um, I think camera is an area that can really uh, do with um, more evolution. You know, the, if you think about a camera on a phone, it sort of basically tries to emulate um, a camera from, you know, a digital camera, which tries to emulate like a, an old analog uh, Kodak type camera. But there's so much more you can do, at, at both at, not just at the software level, but at the hardware level as well. So I think there's, I think there's going to be a lot of innovation across the board for many years to come. Nice, thanks. Um, let's see, I think we're up to the back. Hi, um, we've been trying to get Android into healthcare and hospitals, and we've found that there's a big existing investment in iOS apps that are custom apps, native apps. Um, wondered if you had any advice on more cost-effective ways to help them port that, and specifically uh, wondered whether you guys had ever thought about trying to help start a open source clean room iOS emulator for Android. Uh, let's say that the apps are relatively simple. Let's say that the tablets are enterprise owned. It would be kind of like wine for Linux, but for iOS apps I, on Android. Do we have any legal here who can answer this one? Well, I was, I, was, uh, I was thinking we should go up to Cupertino and ask them to start emulating Android apps, actually. Much better. <laughs> Anyone want to touch that with a barge pole? 
it just it seems like a lot of work for a, a pretty suboptimal user experience. Like, I, I, I don't think that would be very interesting. Yeah. yeah, I think that's generally our approach is to encourage everyone to try and build the best possible Android apps um, rather than trying to figure out how to get apps from other platforms to, to run on it. Um, sure. It's just in a real world, if you have a thousand apps that you've already written that are native, moving those would cost you know, hundreds of developer years. So, you know, any transition strategy, if anybody, a different idea would be great too, but it's a real problem we're trying to struggle with in uh, figuring out how to make Android app, you know, devices work in that, in that field. So. This sounds like an opportunity for all the developers here to write some healthcare <laughs> focused apps. There's a thousand developer hours worth of work, so it's definitely an opportunity. So uh, I probably shouldn't mention that, but um, we are, uh, one of my coworkers recently uh, told me, um, that games that are ported from iOS to Android, they use, I don't remember the name of the framework, but someone like rewrote the iOS UI toolkit with OpenGL on Android. So that might be a way to do it. Uh, it's probably bad for the user experience, but you know, you could try. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we've also got a couple of questions from folks watching on the live screen from uh, Google I.O. extended events. Um, this one's for Ficus. In, uh, in Volley, if you implement a download huge image then resize to fit your needs, will the original image be cached in disk cache or the resized one? <laughs> Hang on a Can second. repeat the question. Uh, it, well, it, it's a hard, uh, they're asking about the disk cache? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the uh, original one goes to the disk cache and the smaller one goes in the memory cache. Nice. Simple. Uh, up the front, please. Um, my name is Tobias from Sweden. I have a framework specific question. Uh, basically, I'm wondering like, if you use a content observer for to serve, uh, observe like SQL like stuff, uh, you get millions of own content change. And I've always been curious why you get so many. <laughs> uh, I think you get one when the content changes. So. <laughs> If, if you're getting a million, you know, notifications that the content I mean, always not a million, but I, like always when I try to observe like data and like let's say one item is inserted, I always get like like at least 10, 15, 20, and I have to put in like a throttle or something to yeah. like. So, so the content provider that you're observing is responsible for sending the notifications, and uh, you know if you're getting a significant amount of them, either the content provider is sending more than it should, and it should be aggregating them. Or you know, more likely, you probably should be using transactions if you're if you have a database. You should be using a transaction, and uh, you know, if you're putting in a significant amount of data at once, use a transaction, uh, and, and then at the end of the transaction, when when the full transaction is committed, then the content provider should send a change notification at that point, as opposed to one for each thing that's happening within the transaction. So you can so you can like change your sort of content provider. Or yeah, I mean, each content provider is responsible for sending those those notifications. So it really depends on which con on which content provider you're using and how the the data is being manipulated uh, by whatever is modifying the data itself. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, from the back. Hi, uh, I'm Thomas from Mountain View. Um, I have a question regarding uh, Google Play services. You've announced uh, at I/O in the past few months uh, new new APIs like Google Plus Sign In and and new GCM features as well. Um, do you do you do you plan to push more um, APIs through the Google Play services? And I guess it's good for developers because you get like, you get the, the new API like, uh, ready really quick. But do you also see it as a way for uh, OEMs not to use their own store and and because they want they want the developers to to get your services as well? Uh, to the first part, you know, I, I think you, if you've been watching what we've been doing with Google Play services, we have been. Uh, you know, steadily increasing the number of APIs that we have included. Uh, you know, we had a, a significant number of new releases uh, with the, the latest release that went out. Um, you know, before that we added maps, and you know, we've, been, we've kind of adding pretty quickly new API sets, and we certainly have you know more work to do. Um, I don't know, Ficus, if you want to talk about the store part, I'll take the second part. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's anything about Google Play services that keeps people from doing their own stores. Um, Amazon App Store still works totally fine. Uh, so we've had a lot of pretty easy questions. I'm going to ask you a couple of tougher ones. So I think everyone's looking forward to, uh, to the possibility of tasting some pie. Now, I know well enough not to ask you about anything specific there. But on behalf of uh, our Australian audience, which I feel like I represent, I wanted to know if any of you have ever tried a lamington. 
And if so, what you thought about it? <laughs> Lamingtons, anyone? No? No one's been even been to Australia, you don't even know what I mean. The, the teleprompter translated that as Lankington, so it's kind of <laughs> tall dessert. What is oh, a Lamington? Can't, people don't know what a Lamington is either. Yeah, what, what is it? Is it a I'll meat bring, pie? Is it made out of sheep? Bring something to work. <laughs> A Tim Tam Slam? What's a Tim Tam Slam? Is that a cocktail with Tim Tam? <laughs> with t oh, that's boring. Oh. <laughs> All right, I think we should go back to the crowd. Um, <laughs> from the front, please. Uh, hi, Savas from London. Um, this is a question sort of related to the question that was asked uh, Larry Page in the keynote, and sort of related to a question that was asked before. Um, it's related to uh, Oracle and Java. Uh, are we ever going to see uh, like Java 7 or Java 8 compliance on Android and taking advantage of the new features that they implemented, not just the language level features, but, you know, fork join, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I don't think we can, uh, I know I can't comment on that anyway. I, I want to know what Larry said to that question. <laughs> it wasn't specifically a question about <laughs> the features of Java 7 or 8 and if we are going to get them, it was more of a question of the relationship with Oracle. And yeah, I'll... Yeah, Second, I, I think it's said. fair to say that no one on this panel should have an opinion, and if they do, they certainly shouldn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going I'm to throw in another question. So uh, having, having watched the uh, Bluetooth best practices talk, it seems like we've changed the Bluetooth stack quite a few times. I was wondering if any of you can uh, explain why that is. You know, why have we got the uh, multiple Bluetooth implementations? Um, we, ch we change it once. Um, not a a few times. Been a uh, times. And, and uh, you, since I got here. No, but I think uh, in total, in lifetime. So we uh, recently changed from uh, Blue Z to Blue Droid. Um, and, uh, you know, the, one of the reasons we did that was um, mostly because Jay Kumar just wanted to do it. He was bored one day. He's like, hey, look at this. Uh, but he, the reason he told me he wanted to do it was that he felt that the new stack uh, was a little bit more uh, efficient for embedded devices. So the previous stack depended on Dbus and Glib which were never really designed uh, for, for embedded. Um, so that was one reason. Um, also, we were seeing a lot of people in the industry, uh, particularly Silicon uh, folks, using this stack. Um, and so we were, you know, to that point I said earlier about trying to streamline, and it was sort of a path of least resistant to adopt that stack. And it's enabled to do new things. So we, we uh, announced yesterday that we're going to be supporting Bluetooth LE in the upcoming release. Um, so. Thanks. Um, from the back. I'm Tam from Japan. Uh, I have a hope about Bluetooth. Uh, I'm implementing a dial-up net dial network profile by software, but uh, Japan, Japanese Android often have a DUN profile already, and those one uh, cannot receive the connection of DUN. So I want to handle uh, service discovery profile. So would you implement it that? Uh, that's a good question. It's so good, I can't answer it. Uh, so we, actually, if you come to office hours tomorrow, uh, we'll try to find somebody who could uh, answer that for you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, from the front. Hi, uh, this is Sobrino from Portugal. Um, with all the emerging uh, pattern that we see in uh, Facebook and uh, all and current and uh, with a left, left drawer and now with a navigation drawer, uh, it seems like the app pattern is getting uh, uh, faded, faded out because a lot of the apps don't implement it well and a lot of the users don't know actually that there is an app, uh, an app and not the back. So uh, how do you see the app uh, pattern uh, with the new navigation drawer? Okay, I'll start with that and then if Adam, Adam can uh, chime in if he likes. Um, so. We actually think that there is uh, definitely a, a continued use for up navigation. Not every application, for starters, um, is well suited by having a side drawer for navigation. It's just simply not applicable for anything that doesn't have that kind of deep hierarchy. Um, second of all, it's actually uh, not a good way to replace a single step uh, going up in a hierarchy. Um, and as you know, that is not always the same use case as back. And simply uh, abandoning that would actually force you to always take a two-step navigation through the drawer, which would be bad, um, or would put you in a potentially temporarily uh, uh, ambiguous uh, action 
um, when you've deep linked from other places as to what back would do. Um, so we're in no way deprecating the, the up pattern. And if you look at the Android design guide, um, you'll see some very specific guidelines on when you should be using that, when you should be using the side drawer. Um, and I think, uh, I think if you've got any questions uh, about the details of that, you should stop by office hours and we can, we can try to clarify that. The, the, the main yeah, question the is, is because uh, um, w w w when you click, it automatically opens or closes the, the, the navigation. And that might confuse some users that are used to the up, um, to the up uh, uh, button. No, we found quite the opposite. We found that actually uh, having it um, have a distinct affordance that's animated makes it very clear to users that they're not going to go up, that it, it provides a different affordance. Okay. Thank you. And you can also see these two things working together in the new update to the Play Music app. If you drill down into, for example, one of the artist or album pages, you can see that even though the up affordance is available, that you can still pull out the drawer and do a quick link to another part of the app if you choose. Uh, so I have a follow-up question. Why does the up affordance point to the left instead of pointing up? It started off pointing up, <laughs> and then I nobody saw it. <laughs> Is that right? No one saw it. The first release of Honeycomb, it started pointing up to the upper left. There you go. Mysteries answered. Uh, from the back. Uh, hi, my name is Lei. I have two quick questions about Android video technologies. The first is, uh, are you guys considering any evolution uh, to video player, like uh, Spot Dash, the new video stream protocol, or subtitling, or, and uh, closed captioning? And the uh, second question is, uh, uh, what would be your focus in the, uh, focus in the short term and the mid term for the Android video technologies? Thanks. Um, yeah, good question. So uh, first one, are we supporting Dash? So we, we um, did a lot of work in the previous release to introduce a lot of low-level APIs to enable people to write their own streaming clients that may be based on HLS or, or Dash. So we introduced Media Codec, Media Extractor, uh, Media Crypto, and I, there's another one which I didn't want to mention because we haven't released it yet. Uh, so, <laughs> so we've done a lot of work on the low level to enable that. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest in Dash. Uh, it's probably something we're going to introduce over time for sure. Uh, in the meantime, with the low level APIs, you can actually create your own um, Dash player. So we actually antici really anticipate seeing developers do that. Uh, closed captioning is something we're looking at also. Um, I think that would be good. Um, to your point about you know the second part of your question, where are we going? I mean, personally, I think the two we should invest more in low-level APIs to uh, allow developer. You know, historically we had this very high-level media player. You give it a URL, it's 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 too high-level for some use cases. So, we want to invest in low-level APIs, and then I think we also want to invest in streaming technologies like HLS, which we already have, and Dash, and and closed captioning and things like that. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so last year we talked a lot about Project Butter, our effort to remove jank from Android. Um, are we done there? Is that mission accomplished, or uh, is that still an ongoing project? Uh, it's it's very much an ongoing project. I really want to pass this microphone. Someone else should talk. I think Roman should talk. I joke. I wanted to say we were done. <laughs> mission accomplished. No. Yeah, it, you know, we're, we, we have a team, Roman and I, uh, meet every week uh, uh, working specifically on this issue. Uh, we made a lot of progress in Jelly Bean, but I still think there's a lot more we can do. We're not at the level that I think we could be. Uh, I think part of it is, is you know, when you take an Nexus 4 or something like that, you, you're kind of spoiled by the, the power of the GPU, and, and you have to really think, you know, you really need to test on multiple different levels of devices. Um, you know, the, that 16.66 millisecond window is critical. If you miss that, you jank, as we say, uh, which basically means that you'll see frame skipping. And so it's critical that we make sure that all our applications are, are efficient and adhering to that, et cetera. Um, but it's, it's something we constantly work at, Romanza. Yeah, expert. and it's not something we can ever be done with. I mean, every time we write new features in applications or in the framework, we have to make sure that, you know, the new code, like, doesn't impact performance. Um, so I've, you know, we've done all that work in Project Butter, and then in 4.1, and in 4.2, we had a new round of that, uh, and we're constantly doing it. I mean, we'll never, never, ever stop. And I'll keep uh, finding bugs for the application developers until they get it right. Uh, so one of the things which really excited me about Project Butter was, was across the entire framework. Is there any other projects which you're able to talk about which have the same sort of holistic view of uh, everything? <laughs> yes, but can't no. talk about them. Yes uh, to the first uh, note Like I said, I have to stop talking. Um, yeah, there was, in Froyo, we had this uh, thing, uh, unbundling, that was actually 
So Android, you know, from the start was really designed to have an open source platform parts that, you know, is everyone open, they can modify, and has all the infrastructure for building all your services on top, and, you know, Google services were what we targeted. And to get 1.0 out, in the time we did, we took a, we cut a few corners on the Google stuff and didn't really build it against the SDK and do all the right stuff. So in um, Froyo, we had a big effort to basically take all the Google apps, get, make them really build on top of the SDK, and clean up all that stuff and get, put, put all the pieces in place. And that, was a, that involved you know, lots of work from the app team. Also in the framework, we had to, you know, like if there were things we needed in the framework and everything to put those in. And that has been you know, like what has allowed us to do like Google Play services and basically deliver a lot of new features to um, existing platforms through these, through, um, um, stuff from Google and other places. Oh yes, and, uh, and there was this thing called Honeycomb. Uh, we added support for <laughs> tablets. Uh, that was a lot of work for the apps, a lot of work for framework. That was you know a huge thing for everybody, and we all worked together on that. Thanks. Uh, let's see uh, from the front. It's great to see you all here for another I/O, and it's good to see some new faces. Um, as Android users and developers, we're kind of vocal a lot. We complain a lot. We uh, <laughs> no. enter lots of issues. We enter lots of comments. Some of them not so kind. We and complain a lot too internally, don't worry. I just wanted us to, go, to pause for a second and uh, applaud for all the great work that this team has done over the years for us. Do we, uh, do we have any other questions like that? <laughs> now, I have one more little of this complaint, guy. Uh, a comment or something. Uh, we, uh, we've been using Android since version one uh, at, with Eclipse as a development system. And um, some people have even written entire books on how to do that. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering what the, uh, what the reasons were and the, the thought behind uh, going in this new uh, direction with IntelliJ. There's a lot of us have to do a lot of extra writing because of this, so it better be a good answer. <laughs> uh, it's not a new direction. It's just a parallel direction. You can still use Eclipse, and you know, we'll keep supporting Eclipse. Uh, a lot of developers told us that they wanted to use IntelliJ because they prefer it. Uh, we should support those developers and you know, help them make applications. Uh, if you're an Eclipse user, you should try IntelliJ. Maybe you'll like it better. If you don't, <laughs> keep using Eclipse. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, it's funny. It's actually, no, please clap. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, it's actually funny because it was one of the questions we used to get early on was uh, why do you only support Eclipse? When are we going to have support for things like IntelliJ? So uh, it makes sense that we've now expanded to include more things. It's Android, not Ordroid. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'll also say years and years ago, well, I guess maybe not years and years ago, but uh, I remember when IntelliJ was first open sourced. I happen to be one of those people who prefers uh, IntelliJ. So I, I found Zav and I said, hey Zav, I said, now that uh, IntelliJ is open source, when are you switching to it? And he said, when Eclipse is done. So. <laughs> uh, right, we're uh, almost out of time. I think we have time for a couple more questions in the back. Are there any plans to update the Google Play Developer Council to support multiple users for a single developer account with varying privileges? For example, to create a developer account that only has access to see crash reports, or another public relations account that can only reply to uh, App Store reviews. Because right now, sharing a single developer council account with a large team is kind of scary. And it's super user access-ish. Uh, yeah, um. Thank you for the. Thank you for the applause, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, have to do is pick the up developer the console does support uh, multiple users and multiple roles. Um, if your question is particularly around um, restricting access to uh, crash reports or something like that, then um, you know, we, we don't we're not done with all of the uh, levels of access that we have, but we do have the foundations of that today. Yeah, I, I think that's fundamentally the answer is we're working on it. Um, you've seen the, the velocity that the uh, developer console team have been working at is pretty staggering. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff they released this year for I.O. and uh, yeah, they're not slowing down anytime soon. So yeah, expect to see more in the future. Uh, so we have about 30 seconds to go. Um, have you got a very quick question? Yeah. Okay, hi, uh, I am Chandra and um, 
I have a question on the presentation framework that came up in Jelly Bean, which is supporting secondary display support. So today, one application can hover over two, uh, two displays, but is there any plan to support two independent displays, one on the local display and the other one on the connected display? And if so, how is the navigation works because the monitors are not touch screen? So keyboard, monitor, uh, keyboard or mouse support or, uh, or is there any vision that you guys have uh, for the presentation? You lied, that was not a very short question. <laughs> I will need a very short answer. <laughs> okay, so the presentation framework itself is very flexible and you can actually today have lots of displays and that kind of stuff. Uh, we completely, completely punted on any kind of input or anything, even in the current thing, you know, the, the secondary display is just a display, you know, maybe in the future, but that's not currently part of the feature set. All right, we are completely out of time. Thank you very much to everyone who asked a question, and thank you to the panel.